So good morning. Uh, continuing our excellent series of talks, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Chandra Hill. Um, Chandra is a senior researcher at Microsoft Research in New York. She is also a distinguished research fellow at the Annenberg uh, Public Policy Center at, at University of Pennsylvania. Before coming to Microsoft Research in New York City, she was an assistant professor in the operations and information management at Wharton School at University of Pennsylvania. She has a PhD in information systems uh, from NYU Stern Business School, and she's gonna talk to us about interactions between TV content and social media. So please uh, welcome Chandra Hill, thank you. Hello everybody. Um, so I'm really happy to be here. Um, as Tina mentioned, I study television and how people respond to it, which is a pretty lowbrow thing to do um, in an academic context. So usually when I ask people in academic audiences if they watch television, people are really hesitant to raise their hand. So I won't ask you that question here. Um, <laughs> But the reality is that a lot of people watch television still, even uh, linear television, and they comment about television a lot um, on social media. And they do the same thing for brands. So this work is really looking at how we can take advantage of um, all of the social content that people are contributing around television and brands to um, compare different methods for making link prediction, among, among other things. So the spirit of this is kind of fun. Hopefully I'll get through um, all of the slides. I kind of put two, two talks together and I, I took out a lot of the detail. So hopefully um, I'll still be able to distill a lot of the meaning from, um, from what we did. So um, what I'm gonna do is show how we compared different methods for basically creating networks of companies or um, or television shows. So the networks here really are focused on how do we find affinity networks between, between brands, companies, um, and television shows. And I'm gonna compare a text-based approach to doing that to just using a product network. So the thing that would be obvious to do, looking at how companies are connected through users. And the data that we're gonna use here are data from Twitter. And then in the second study, I'm gonna compare how social network prediction compares to these same product, um, product networks. And the methods are not super sophisticated that we're gonna use, so we could make these models that we build um, better. The point is more just to understand what we can learn from these types of data and sort of where some of those data are better than others um, in the particular context that I'm gonna talk about. So really it's about focusing on um, marketing um, information and advising, advertising insights, okay? So um, the first research question then is, when does text-based audience link prediction work better than a collaborative filtering type approach? And so we can look at categories of shows or categories of brands, the brand strength, and the network on Twitter. Um, and if you remember nothing else from these this talk, I'm just gonna give you a couple of slides. So we're gonna form groups by looking at who connects to brands on social media, so specifically Twitter um, and television shows, and these then form groups of people, so groups that are interested in a particular thing. Um, and so what I'm gonna tell you is what those people say, both as individuals, says a lot about them, and what they say in groups says a lot about the group. And those groups can then be used to calculate similarity between brands and television shows for the purpose of creating these affinity networks. And also, I'm gonna say who you are connected to actually matters for predicting things about you, right? So there have been a lot of um, papers that look at social network-based prediction, so predicting age and gender and all of these things from your friends, so the people that we can observe that you're connected to, usually on sites like Facebook and Twitter, um, but we can also do the same thing for brands. And where a lot of papers have fallen short in the past is that they focus on one brand or one context, and that's just because that's the data that they have. But this particular context allows us to really see when social network-based prediction would work, and similarly when text-based and product-based prediction would work. So what I'm gonna show you is that from publicly available data, so Twitter, 
we can collect a really interesting data set to begin to compare different methods for text-based um, uh, uh, affinity network based prediction as well as social network and product network. Um, and we can test all of those and compare them using just data that are available um, on Twitter. And so what we're gonna offer is a new user-generated content-based approach that capitalizes on the fact that we can observe what people follow, what they say, who they're connected to, um, and this can basically complement other recommendation engines. And then we just demonstrate how we can explain the results that we get, and I'll, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, so differences from prior work are just that we, we collect this data in a way that allows us to analyze it um, in, a, in a clever way. There's no preset ontology, so we don't go in with a set of brands or television shows that uh, we focus on. Um, instead, we're just looking at all of the search, all of the tweets that these people make. Um, and so that's more than just looking at co-occurrence of mentions of brands and television shows. Um, and then we combine this data with data from another source on the demographics and show that we can infer demographics of these groups, which is, by the way, a really hard problem and something that companies pay a lot of money for this type of data. Okay. So I'm going to tell you about our recommendation system setup. Um, what we're calling a recommendation system. So really, we're trying to do link prediction for users. So we're going to collect data from um, handles for brands and television shows. We get all of the brand followers of those shows. And then we get the followers and friends of those followers, as well as all of their tweets. Okay. So again, we start with Twitter handles of brands and TV shows. We collect their followers. Then for those followers, we get their social networks, so the friends and followers, as well as their tweets. So that's our data. So what that allows us to do is we can take for those users, not just that they follow a particular brand or television show, but when they follow multiple brands or television shows, we can build models to predict, given a, a particular subset, um, the things that we've held out, right? So we give our model um, a few of the brands that these people have followed, and then predict the ones that, that we've held out, or at least try to do that. And so this data set allows us to do that, and to do that using different methods for creating affinity networks. Um, so we're assuming that we don't know um, individual level um, data, and that we want to be able to predict things about these users. So the data look like this. So we have the follower network. So let's say we have three shows, American Idol, The Voice, and Duets. We then get their follower networks, and we can find shows that have followers in common. Okay. Um, for those followers, we basically restricted um, it to followers who followed at least two shows or, uh, or brands. And the reason for that, again, is because we want to give our systems one or more of those brands and predict um, a holdout brand to see whether, based on our affinity networks, we can do that well. Um, we randomly sampled up to 1,000 um, users in each of the shows and brands uh, follower network and then sort of built out the bigger network from there. So for the data that we collect on tweets, what I want to remind you of, as I mentioned earlier, is we don't focus just on tweets that include branded information. We take instead all of the tweets that the followers of these brands or television shows have made. So we collect up to the past 400 tweets for each user, um, and each tweet is randomly assigned to one show or the other. So we don't um, basically have double counting, otherwise we'd be able to recreate the network of the users, right? So if a, if a user is connected to multiple shows, we take their tweet and randomly assign it to one of the shows that um, they're connected to. And so we want to make sure that the people we're making predictions for are actually people. And so we have a threshold of 2,000 followers, which above we kind of throw those, um, those Twitter handles out because we assume that they're either celebrity-ish, right? So you guys, maybe some of you have more than 2,000 followers and you think you're a celebrity. Um, so you would be thrown out of our study as well as sort of big uh, brands and, and so on. So we want to make sure these are people. Then we get the social network of users. So for those users that are connected to the brands, we also get their social network. So what we would be able to see then um, 
what we would be able to see then are whether two followers of, um, of shows are connected to one another, okay? All right, so we built a lot of sophisticated models. I'm gonna just keep it really simple and show you the simple models because I think um, the results that we got from these are pretty interesting by themselves. So we construct affinity networks between brands. So for both the text-based approach and um, the product-based approach, we um, basically calculate the similarity between brands and television shows by looking at the follower bases of these things. So in the case of text, we take the text of these users and calculate the similarity between two groups or two shows using strictly the text. Um, in the case of um, the product network, shows are similar or brands are similar if they share a lot of followers in common and then we calculate the results of our model. So we take users, we um, say, okay, this user followed a few brands, and then based on the affinity network that we have constructed, we say, okay, let's predict um, additional brands that um, we think that they would also follow. We measure our predictions based on precision and recall. So a show network confidence measure, or um, this uh, uh, product network that we've constructed is a really simple one. So shows are similar using just a really simple association rule metric. So we take the number of, um, of followers that a particular brand or show have in common here, and then we divide that by the total number of followers that that user has. So a really simple metric. And so there's a direction then on the, um, on the link between two brands. Okay, and so for, that, for this particular measure, um, we think of this almost as an oracle, right? And the reason why is, if you were to go to Twitter, they're gonna recommend um, products and brands and handles to you, right? And because of that, then things that are similar should be connected through users. So we think of this product network approach really as an oracle that we're trying to compare everything else to. Um, then we have the social network of users as, as I mentioned before. And so um, somebody is similar, um, in that case, we're taking the people that are directly connected and asking which brands do those users follow and using that to make predictions for the user. Um, and finally, we compare to reasonable baselines just simply, like should we recommend the most popular brands or most, television, most popular television shows to users? Okay, so for the text-based approach, we collect all of these tweets, we create a document. So one document that represents each brand or television show, we tokenize the data, and then we simply calculate the similarity between documents after scoring um, the tokens using a TFIDF score. So a really simple model where we just calculate that similarity using cosine similarity. And just as a reminder, we take all of the tweets that people mention um, during that time. So when we take a holdout sample, run cross-validation, and, and sort of put those users into our model um, using the affinity network that we built on the, the training data of users, what we find is, so this is just showing uh, results with respect to precision for television shows. So on the horizontal axis, because it looks a little bit blurry, you have the number of recommendations that we're making, and on the vertical axis, you have the precision. And what you can see here is that this top line corresponds to the performance of how well the product network approach is doing, and then the second line is, um, the second best performer, is the performance of what happens when we just use the text-based approach. So now we used a really stupid text-based method calculating the affinity between brands and television shows, and this works really well out of the box, almost as good as this oracle, which is connecting brands through users that they have in common. Um, similarly, that's the case for recall. So nothing super smart here, but we don't even need the network in this case. Um, when we restrict the data to only taking tokens that are English-based, we don't see um, any degradation in, in performance. So what we wanted to know um, after doing this, so we basically can replicate almost the, the product network using this text-based approach, we wanted to know why this is actually working. Um, and so it turns out that these words actually that, that people say 
um, are, are really rich and represent a lot about the audiences of these brands and television shows. So we correlated the TFIDF scores of each of the different tokens one by one um, with um, uh, different shows. And so for American Idol, the top, um, the top words are Idol Birthday Snugs from Solid Girls, which is a show about um, wedding gowns, um, it's bridal, wedding, uh, Cobell Report petition and bu bullying and so on. So people are talking about related content to the show even after pulling out the tweets um, about shows. So what we wanted to know in addition to whether um, you know, the conversations are representing interest is whether the text is actually representing something about the demographics of these users. So what we did is we took the same document with the TFIDF scores uh, associated with the tokens, and we correlated those with aggregate level demographics that we got from Facebook. So what we did is we tricked, well, let me say, we um, used the, um, we used the API for, for Facebook advertising, and we put in um, shows and brands. So in this case, we put in the voice, and we asked to give us all of the users in the United States that follow the voice. So we get a number for how many people follow the voice on Facebook. And then we further restrict things. So then we say, how many people follow the voice that are women? Or how many people follow the voice that are men? Or how many people follow the voice that are of a particular um, age? And so from that, we can get the proportion of people of particular demographics that follow a show or brand. Okay, So there we have aggregate level demographics as well as interest. So on the advertising um, interface for Facebook, you can also put in um, interest. So things like, give me people who like biking or or um, gardening, and so on. So we then took our data, so these TFIDF scores for associated with each word, so think of this as one row corresponding to a show, and we correlated these scores with the aggregate level demographics that I just mentioned that we got from Facebook. And so what we got then is a summary of what types of words are associated with groups that follow shows that have a high proportion of women or a high proportion of men or a high proportion of young people um, and so on. So here, these are just word clouds that show the types of words that show up for shows that have a skew towards a female audience versus a shows that have a skew towards a male audience. So women, um, audiences talk about love and cute and happy and men talk about games and zombies and things like that. <laughs> um, so the time is not going down. Can I have a time check? Oh, okay. So, um, so I'm going to skip through a lot of things then. So we do this for, um, so we do this for high proportion female and, and so on and we get similar words. So these are just correlation coefficients with, associated with um, being an audience associated with a, a, male sh uh, a female show, male show, and all of these other demographics. And you see these really interesting things pop up with really um, you know, sort of high level aggregate level information on the demographics. We do this for geography, for interest, um, for multi-dimensional um, categories, and you get really interesting results in this particular context all the time. So what we find is that the demographic features um, were driving the results. Um, and so when this particular approach, the text-based approach, works better in comparison to the product-based approach, it's for really um, niche shows. So those shows that have a skew towards one demographic or the other. So on this horizontal axis, what we have is um, KL divergence, so higher means that it's an atypical audience with respect to the first graph is age, the second one education, and the third one is gender. And so the bottom line goes up. So as the, um, as the skew increases, the text-based approach improves. Okay, so the more niche the audience, the better the, the text-based approach um, works. Um, and so the product network approach d dominates when there's little um, demographic skew, but once there's a demographic skew, the, the work, uh, the product, the text-based uh, approach works better. 
So here we're just showing that these can actually be complements. So this approach for the text-based um, method actually can be used to fill in when the product network-based approach does not work well. For instance, when the product doesn't have a lot of followers, okay? So when it's both niche and a small network, then the, the text-based approach can not only win, but then fill in the gaps. So think of this as helping with the cold start problem in a recommendation engine. So the main conclusions here then are, on average, the text-based approach does worse than collaborative filtering. However, the text-based approach does well for niche products. And I, I would say even more importantly, it does well just kind of out of the box. Like, so imagine if you didn't have the network, you, can do, you could take this approach or see um, who is following a particular um, brand, and by following I don't mean connected through a network, but instead have given you some indication that they're interested in a particular product or brand or anything really on the web, and you create these groups and you can associate them with high level demographics. Um, there's variation across the brands and, and TV shows, which is, which is systematic across brand type um, and TV type with respect to size and niche, and the best approach depends on um, both the TV show type and brand. So I'll just say one thing, um, one more thing. So I was planning to talk a little bit about when social network-based um, methods work. And I just want to show you one plot because I'm not going to have time to go through everything. So the one plot that I want to show you um, is this one. So for a long time, people have been studying whether social network-based prediction can work. And what I mean by that is you take the number of friends that somebody has that is a particular gender or age or has bought a product or has followed a brand and so on. And usually people study this just in one context. So I've done a lot of work in telecom, for example, where I see that people who are connected to people with certain services are likely to buy them. But no one has looked at um, whether social network-based approach will work for all types of brands or all types of products. And so this particular data allows us to compare whether social network-based approach will work for all types of brands, at least in the context of Twitter. And so again, what we find is, and so this, these plots are just taking the difference of recall for the product-based approach that I explained earlier, and a social network-based approach, we're just saying, how many friends in my neighborhood follow a particular brand or television show? And when things show up down here, so when the difference is negative, these are things where a social network-based approach works best. And when it's positive, it's things where um, a product network-based approach works best. And so what you see again is the social network-based approach works best for products and, and television shows that have a niche audience, right? Which makes sense, right? So this can get into these people are, are probably homophilous. And for the brands that are widespreading and just have a general audience, then the network of users with respect to the people that they're connected to wouldn't matter. So I'll just leave you with this. This one data set that we collected in public, it's free for everyone, allowed us to compare these different strategies for collecting um, data about brands and television shows, constructing affinity networks, and then making link predictions for people and what they follow otherwise. And so this is quite powerful, not only for the link prediction problem, but to be able to use it as a test bed for a lot of different methods to both compare to, to network-based methods as well as to combine those methods um, with network-based network methods. So hopefully I've convinced you of that, and thanks for your time. Thank you. This is most amazing, interesting, awesome uh, application of networks I've ever seen. But does your algorithm de detect sarcasms? Sarcasms? No, it doesn't. So, but we didn't try to. So, the power of it is that we didn't do anything smart with the text, right? We just like took it as is and used it to calculate the similarity between groups, just based on all the things that people who follow a particular thing, product or brand, say. Yeah. Um, and so, there's room for um, a lot of other things, and sure. we're happy to share the data. And. Why do you think just having recall separately and precision separately, not precision versus recall and take the area under the curve versus number of recommendations? Yeah. Because detecting more false positive and less false negatives is what... Uh... Yeah, so so that's a great question. So we so I, again, I sort of took out a lot of the meat of this. So we've done a lot of things, um, including like looking at cross categories, like so a lot of different measures, including looking at ROC curves. And so I just didn't get to it. 
Um, and so there are different ways that you can evaluate the performance of this link prediction, and we've done that using both the method that I, sh that I explained to you, as well as using um, uh, ROC curve. Thank you for a great talk. So maybe you have already gi uh, given an answer to my question, but I might miss it. I was busy tweeting about your talk. <laughs> so my, <laughs> my question is, uh, as we all know, the Twitter is now full of lots of lots of uh, manipulated information, not just a fake uh, bot or even people, live people who might be actually doing the marketing intentionally. So do you use any algorithm to detect those and then filter them out? Um, so that's a really great question. So we've collected, we collected this data a while back, um, and at the time, it didn't seem like that was as big of an issue. Since then, I've worked on other projects with Twitter data where we try to understand, for instance, the impact of events on Twitter, even advertising events for brands, and we have had to be really, really smart about identifying bots and, and Twitter handles that are just broadcasting and repeating pretty much anything about brands. So it's a huge problem for brands in particular, and we didn't know that until we started looking at the data for other projects. So you have to deal with it, and it's a great question. <laughs>